So we're going to talk about viruses in this short video. There are many f types of viruses and many shapes that they come in. Um, and so we're interested in what viruses are. They're not actually cells. They are particles. They're considered non-living because they have to invade living host cells in order to direct them to reproduce more viruses. So um, what are they then? Well, we can think of all viruses as at least having some components. Um, those include um, this blue part, which is the protein capsid. Um, so they have some kind of coat. Um, and then some kind of nucleic acid inside. Um, that nucleic acid can be DNA, if it's a DNA virus, or in some cases there are what are called RNA retroviruses that I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, later. Um, some viruses just have the capsid and nucleic acid. Other viruses also have an envelope surrounding all of that. Um, but again, not all viruses do this. Typically that viral envelope is derived from the host cell membrane itself. So if a virus breaks into a cell and directs the cell to reproduce more viruses, part of what some viruses do is they'll actually bud off a piece of the membrane and that, that'll be the envelope that then surrounds the virus inside. Sometimes that envelope will also have important proteins. Um, typically these are glycoproteins. And these could be really important for allowing the virus to trick another host cell into letting it in. Uh, because after all, the first thing a virus needs to do is it needs to enter. So let's talk about the concept of host range just a little bit. Viruses are limited into what kind of cells they can break into because typically they have some kind of molecular signature that allows them to break into a particular type of cell only. So on the right, I'm showing here um, different plant leaves infected with something called tobacco mosaic virus. Um, if I were to brush against that with my hand, um, I probably wouldn't get sick with the, the tobacco mosaic virus myself because we animals are sort of so d different in evolutionary heritage from plants now that it would be very unlikely that the proteins on the surface of the plant cell membranes would be very close to the proteins on my own cells. Um, in fact, in most multicellular organisms, viruses might only be able to break into certain kinds of cells uh, within um, our own bodies. Uh, for example, uh, the cold there, um, as I show sneezing, um, a cold virus might only be able to break into certain lung cells, not, say, my heart or my brain cells. Um, and likewise, if I were to sneeze onto a plant, I doubt that it would catch a cold. So there's, there's this kind of concept of host range. Uh, this might... Uh, be important in terms of mutation. Perhaps by mutation certain viruses might acquire different shapes to break into the cells of different species. So if you've heard concern about the avian flu, for example, possibly jumping species to humans, um, that is a possibility if they were to, uh, the viral proteins were to be changed in such a way that they could potentially break into uh, human cells. So let's talk about what a typical virus will do if it breaks into a host cell successfully. Technically, we only use the words lytic and lysogenic for phage viruses, or viruses that infect bacteria, although I might kind of be a little bit um, um, less uh, strict in class and sort of say that, that, that human viruses might display characteristics of a typical lytic or lysogenic type virus. So uh, let's talk about the lytic cycle first. So the virus has to be able to attach and potentially break in. It's going to release its nucleic acid into uh, the host cell. And in a lytic style virus, that nucleic acid will immediately start attracting the attention of uh, enzymes and ribosomes to transcribe mRNA copies of that uh, DNA code and potentially then to translate into new viral proteins. So it's going to um, use the cell's resources, use the cell's nucleotides, use the cell's amino acids, use the cell's um, ATP in order to build new viruses. Um, in fact, uh, some lytic viruses are so virulent that the cell will literally explode or lice with all of the viruses that they've made. And then those millions or billions of viruses will, will try to repeat the cycle by finding another bacteria to infect. Um, so lytic viruses you can think of as being like very active. 
Whereas on the other hand, lysogenic style viruses are kind of reproducing themselves in a slightly sneakier way. Um, here is a virus once again inserting its nucleic acid into the host cell. Um, in this case, um, in a lysogenic style strategy, that, that virus um, nucleic acid will eventually need to become DNA and integrate itself into the host cell chromosome. So remember that bacteria have one circular chromosome. That's why they're showing it integrating here. Um, and, and it might just kind of sit there dormant um, for some part of its life cycle. Um, nevertheless, it can still reproduce itself successfully this way because if the cell undergoes binary fission and produces a new bacterial cell, it will also copy the virus DNA that's contained within. So even in this kind of more dormant infiltration style of, of virus infection, um, it can still promote the, the virus's fitness and, and reproduction. Although it should be said that lysogenic style viruses can go lytic. Um, there seem to be certain maybe signaling pathways or triggers that it can detect, um, and then the virus DNA will leap out of the, uh, uh, the host cell DNA, and it will, just like in lytic style, uh, actively transcribe and translate the needed genes. So here's just kind of a simple uh, way to summarize some of what I just said uh, between uh, differences between the lytic and the lysogenic cycle. And then finally, I just want to end the video by talking a little bit about retroviruses in particular. Uh, retroviruses are of great interest to me because they are RNA viruses. Um, I show a little diagram here of HIV uh, that infects human T cells specifically. We'll talk about T cells soon. Um, and what makes retroviruses so interesting is that when they insert their RNA code into the host cell, um, they often have to have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that they also bring with them. Um, and the key idea here is that in a very um, initial step, they're going to need to turn their viral RNA into viral DNA. Um, and so that's called reverse transcription because that's, uh, that's opposite the usual pathway of going from DNA master code to RNA copy that we're used to from molecular genetics. Um, and what, what is so interesting about this process is that uh, the reverse transcriptase enzymes of most retroviruses are very poor proofreaders. And so when they're making the double-stranded DNA, they're going to make a lot of errors. Um, uh, and what that does is it effectively creates a mutation rate in retroviruses that is much higher than that of really any other organism. Um, and that's of interest to us because we would predict that RNA viruses like the flu, like HIV, evolve at a much faster rate than even DNA viruses do uh, because the mutation rate's higher. And that's acceptable to them because if you make millions of offspring every time you break into a cell, let's say, um, then it doesn't really matter if, say, maybe even as much as half of your offspring have mutations that um, disable them from being able to break into future cells and, and not reproduce if 50% uh, of the offspring still can successfully uh, reproduce. So retroviruses are a really interesting example of, of, of an increased evolution um, due to a higher mutation rate. So we just talked a little bit about basic viruses. We talked about what a virus is made of, um, lytic and lysogenic strategies once they break into a host cell, and uh, a special little conversation about retroviruses in particular.